It seems like every year for the last four years, the college football ranks have sent a Hall of Fame caliber running back talent to the NFL draft. First, it was Todd Gurley, who was seen as the new Marshawn Lynch, and then Zeke Elliott, who was the new Frank Gore, and then Leonard Fournette as, of course, the new Adrian Peterson. The fourth and final member of that quartet, however, might be more dangerous than all of them because Penn State Saquon Barkley reminds me of a running back that was better than all of them, the great Ladanian Tomlinson. I still remember the first time I saw Saquon Barkley run. I was charting Christian Hackenberg at the time for a pre-draft scouting report, and the first game I put on was the 2015 primetime battle with Ohio State. Now, keep in mind that the 2015 OSU squad was one of the most loaded college defenses of all time. So loaded that future top five talents like Malik Hooker and Marshawn Lattimore were riding the bench, and Barkley was still just a teenage true freshman. 10 of the 11 starting Ohio State defenders went on to play in the NFL, and yet still with virtually no offensive line in front of him, that teenage true freshman completely obliterated the Buckeyes on 26 carries for 194 yards. Joey Bosa, Darren Lee, Garyon Conley, Michael Thomas, even Ezekiel Elliott himself, I mean the list goes on and on for how many future high draft picks were on that Buckeye roster, and 18-year-old Saquon Barkley was still the best player on the field. Right then and there, I knew he was special, and I've been patiently waiting to watch him on Sundays ever since. Barkley, to me, is the perfect complement to the bruisers we've seen enter the league recently, like Fournette, Elliott, and Gurley. Looking at Fournette last year in particular, coming out of LSU, he was defined by raw violence and tenacity. He was Earl Campbell, he was Jim Brown, he was the very embodiment of a north-south runner, but Barkley is much different. He's creative, he's shifty, and rather than breaking tackles with pure power like Fournette, he's so quick that he just sidesteps those tackles in the first place. When I watch him, I can't not see LaDainian Tomlinson because their skill set is literally identical. The ability to take a pass in the flat and make a guy miss in space for a big gain, the speed on the edges, the ridiculous jump cuts, the vision and patience to work through traffic inside. I mean, it's frightening how close to a mirror image they really are. There was a play against Iowa this past season that might as well have been from a Chargers game in 2006. It's an option run and Iowa linebacker Josie Jewell has Barkley dead to rights on the backside. Jewel is leveraged properly outside, he's got safety help if he needs it, and against 99% of all running backs, this would be a tackle for no gain. But Barkley is not part of that 99%. He gives a little nod inside to get Jewel the bite, and then jump cuts two full yards all the way outside to avoid the tackle and spring himself to the second level. And what's most important to watch here is how low his hips get on this cut. He's like a loaded spring readying himself to uncoil, and what he does, he's just so damn explosive that Jewel can barely even touch him. This cut right here is the difference between a good running back and a franchise cornerstone, and I think Barkley is going to be a franchise cornerstone for a very long time. Once he's on the second level, he sucks two more defenders in and then bounces once again to the edge where he turns on that 4-3 speed to get to the sideline. This run is quintessential Saquon Barkley. The vision, the agility, the speed, all of it. He does this every single game. And I think what really allows him to consistently produce runs like this is that as he's working through traffic and as his eyes are reading from hole to hole, his hips are always low. He's always in that coiled spring position so that as soon as he needs to explode and hit a crease, he can get there immediately. He never raises his pad level too early because when you raise your pad level too early, you lose all of your burst, all of your change of direction ability, and all of your power. It's truly remarkable how long he's able to stay in that low stance throughout the run because believe me, that is not easy. Being that low all the time is exhausting. It's like doing squats for four straight quarters and yet 15, 20, 30 touches into a game, he's still doing it. He's still cutting with extremely low hip bend and not losing any speed or any momentum whatsoever. There are zero wasted steps in his movement no matter how tired he is. I mean, hell, at the end of the Iowa game, he was at over 40 total touches and still burning linebackers in the flat as if he was on totally fresh legs. The stamina it takes to do that, to still be that explosive late in the fourth quarter with the game on the line, just that alone is exceptionally rare. He is just a complete, utter freak of nature. I struggle to even find any negatives in his game tape, and I almost feel bad for nitpicking just for the sake of finding something to nitpick. He's got great forward body lean and can work between the tackles. He has fantastic vision and can read flashes of jersey color in the hole and then redirect and find a new lane just on instinct. He has really improved his hands and can be extremely dangerous as a receiving option out of the backfield, although he does have a concentration drop every now and then. 
Even his pass protection is way ahead of most other running backs his age. And that's not to say that he's perfect in blitz pickups, because he's not. He still does drop his head way too much for my liking, and I think he's going to get burned a few times in training camp before he learns to cut that out. But in terms of being able to get square to the blitzer, getting low, having a wide base, and using leverage to absorb the rush, he's already got all of that down just fine. Honestly, his main hurdle in pass pro is probably just going to be playbook related, and it will likely take some time to acclimate himself to how NFL offenses design their blitz pickups. But still, that's something you could say about almost every running back coming out of college, so it's not a huge negative to me. Now, I suppose if we're looking for a criticism that's a bit more substantial, I do think that he suffers from Barry Sanders syndrome a little bit, wherein he tries way too hard to make something out of nothing and ends up making a bad run even worse. We saw that multiple times against Iowa and Ohio State where his offensive line got smoked and rather than just lowering his shoulder and trying to get back to the line of scrimmage, he danced in the backfield, retreated, and eventually had to give up at an even bigger loss. But again, to me, this is still overall a minor issue. Most of his negative runs were not because he danced too long in the backfield, but rather just because the Penn State offensive line has previously been and still is not very good. After his 69-yard touchdown off a direct snap to start the Michigan game, he averaged just 2.8 yards per carry throughout the rest of the day. He was facing packed boxes on every play, and his line could barely generate any movement whatsoever. In the bowl game against Washington, it was the same thing. He was able to rip off a 92-yard touchdown run, but on his 17 other carries, he only averaged 2.6 yards per attempt. When his line gave him any room to work with at all, he was able to use his gifts to capitalize on it, but rarely did they ever actually give him that room. Against Ohio State this past season, that problem was even more apparent. 10 out of Barkley's 21 carries against OSU were for either no gain or a loss of yardage. That's essentially half of his carries that ended up going backwards. He gained 44 yards on the day, but lost 38, which is frankly unheard of. Barkley had very few touches with any space to run, so as the game wore on, he tried to take matters into his own hands again and got burned for it. I think if you put Barkley behind not even a good offensive line, but just an average one, he'll put up special, special numbers, like rookie of the year in a landslide kind of numbers. He's that gifted, and the fact that his only negatives on tape are a minor technical flaw in pass protection and a habit of trying to pick up too much slack when his line can't do their jobs, I mean, if any general managers pass on this kid because of that, then we've got problems. Barkley is the NFL draft equivalent of a slam dunk on a four foot hoop. You can't miss. So unless you have a desperate need at quarterback like the Browns, then you have zero excuses not to take him. I don't care that the Giants just drafted Paul Perkins and Wayne Gallman. I don't care that Marlon Mack looked great as a rookie for the Colts. I don't care that the Broncos still have CJ Anderson and Devontae Booker. If any of those teams pass on Barkley for any reason other than taking a quarterback, then I will be extremely disappointed. If you have a chance to draft the second coming of LaDainian Tomlinson in the top five, you do it. It does not matter what other running backs you have on the roster, you just take him. He fits every scheme, he fits every game plan, he runs zone, he runs power, he pass protects, he catches, he returns, and he works his ass off in the weight room and in the film room. I'm not a Browns, Giants, Colts, or Broncos fan, but if I were, I would be extraordinarily upset if any of those front offices let this chance slip through their fingers. So please, John Dorsey, Dave Gettleman, Chris Ballard, or John Elway, any of you, I'm begging all of you on behalf of your fans, just take him. Thank you so much for watching the first installment of this year's draft scouting report series. I started last year's series with a report on Leonard Fournette, so I figured I would start this year with a report on the next big thing at running back. There's a bunch of teams that are probably strongly considering taking him or even trading up for him, and I gotta say I would not be surprised if he goes as high as second overall to the Giants. Hell, if the Browns go get Kirk Cousins in free agency, I'd probably pencil him in for first overall to Cleveland too. He's the best player in the draft and he deserves to go that high, but we still have to wait a few months and get through free agency and all that before we see where his most realistic destinations are. If you want to support the channel directly through the draft process as we steam closer to that fabled 100,000 subscriber mark, you can of course find the link to my Patreon page in the description. I'll have a bunch of patron-only content coming out all throughout the spring, including weekly mock drafts leading up to my mock draft special. I'll put out a top 50 big board as soon as I actually chart enough players to fill out a top 50 big board. I'll have positional rankings and all that kind of stuff. All of that will be available to all patrons regardless of how much you donate. It could be a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars, whatever you want to donate is totally up to you. Everybody will have access to the exact same content regardless of your financial situation. 
So go check out that page. I'll have more scouting reports and more mock drafts coming out on this channel every week. And I'll see you next Monday with another episode. So until then, later.